Hello, good evening. Welcome, my name is Daniel Peabody. I'm a director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. And on behalf of myself, Elizabeth, and the whole gallery team, I'd like to welcome you uh, and thank you for joining us tonight for our virtual opening and exhibition tour with the artists MK Guth and Ginny Park. Um, our, um, this is the final exhibition in our 40th anniversary program. This year, 2021, was our the gallery's 40th anniversary, and we are thrilled to have both these artists as part of that program this year um, and to be wrapping up the anniversary program with them. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight, and I want to encourage you to ask questions. This um, conversation is being streamed live on several different platforms. Um, I think most of those platforms, you can ask a question or make a comment, um, and it should appear in the comment section. And if you have questions for either artist or for myself, um, please go ahead and um, ask those questions, and we will get to them towards the end of um, each segment of the conversation. But um, we welcome your, your input and questions. Um, both of these exhibitions, uh, Ginny Park Windows and MK Guth Touching Matter, uh, are opening today. Uh, November 4th, and will be on view through December 31st of this year, 2021. Um, we are going to start the conversation tonight by talking with Jenny Park about her exhibition, which you're seeing um, on camera. And we'll talk with Jenny for a few minutes, and then we'll transition and talk with MK for a few minutes. But I want to welcome you both. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so Jenny Park, uh, is has shown with the gallery for I think six years or seven years, and this is her fourth solo exhibition at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. We are uh, thrilled to be doing this show. Um, I think our first um, time we took Jenny Year to work to an art fair in 2016, uh, you won the Pam Prize, the Pam Pix Prize from the Perez Art Museum in Miami and the Pulse Miami Art Fair, and I kind of knew that you know that we, we, had, we were on to something with your work when a curator from a main huge international um, museum selected your work the first time we took it to a fair. And so we are thrilled to have our fourth solo show with you. And of course, you're showing your work uh, not only here in Portland, but all over the country and, and the world. Um, and I know you've had several shows um, in uh, your native um, South Korea. So uh, well, I want to welcome you and um, thanks for being here. So I wanted to sort of uh, maybe just start off by talking about how you begin a painting. How do you begin making one of your paintings? I first plan uh, building the structure. I think it's really important because I often found that the structure of the painting become like a sketch of the final work. I don't make any sketches like pre-drawn images for the final work. So the structure and the fabric, zone fabric, become like a guideline for paint application. So you're building the structure, um, the wood, in this case, the wooden stretcher structure that, and then you're sewing different, um, based on my understanding, you're sewing different um, canvas and muslin and um, cheesecloth and organza, and you're kind of sewing all these different materials together into kind of a composition that's a fabric composition or a textile composition that you're then stretching over the structure uh, and then you paint, is that correct? Yes. Um, how am I just curious, how much of the sort of decision-making, like do you kind of know when you're sewing the structure, the, the, the textile component of the structure? Do you have a sense like, oh, this part's gonna be red or this part's gonna be, you know, purple? Um, or do you, is it more an intuitive process? The color choices definitely I really cannot expect. That's something that I cannot really measure. It's just I paint over and over and over until I find the color that I really like. So it takes a long time to find the right color and I really don't know where it goes. But so, oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah. When I make the stru structure like a stretcher bar and make the sewn element, I want to make sure how much I want to expose and how much I, I want to hide. That part of the painting process, I 
I plan a lot and I make the sketch for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about your inspiration uh, as it relates to interiors, furniture, meditate, and your meditations on windows? You've titled the show Windows, and I would love to hear um, some background on that. I, I My painting always has been having those like transparency and I really enjoy seeing them in my painting that kind of made me start thinking like underneath of the surface so it's kind of like the painting looks to me like a window stained glass something like letting the light come through so Ultimately, I want my painting to be in a room, like an object in a room, like a furniture. So they become like a part of the room where it is located, blending into the room and observing, affecting its surroundings, including light, like shadow, like light hitting the surface. And then uh, as I building this structure, especially for this show, I sanded, stain and oil, and it really felt like building furniture. You know, uh, you've, you've had, in the four shows we've had together, you've often played with transparency and opacity and um, you know, the beautiful dance between those, not only in terms of materials, but also in terms of the saturation of color that's applied. Um, but, uh, and in the, I think the previous show, there were some openings and windows into the, that revealed some of the structure of the, of the, um, the canvases and objects themselves. But I think in this show, you kind of went an extra layer. You kind of just mentioned that not only did you build the stretchers, but you are also like working with the stretchers, the wood of the stretchers, like you would furniture. So, um, you know, they're actually finished and uh, oiled and stained like a piece of furniture. Um, on our online viewing room, uh, which I don't know if any people have uh, people watching have had a chance to visit yet, but I would encourage you to visit our gallery website and view both these exhibitions in the online viewing rooms where there's you can kind of take a deep dive into them. But you actually sent us a photograph, Ginny, of one of the windows in your home um, that we included on that, sort of looking at the world through the window. And can you talk a little bit about um, how you know the last um, 18 months that we've all been experiencing, how your relationship with the inside and outside and how that relates to the structure of the windows and the paintings? You know, I, I obviously look out of the window a lot because I stayed at home most of the time last year. And it was quite amazing to see like how little changes I started noticing that I wasn't really focusing on in the past. So definitely the light and the color of like trees, sky. And I really miss seeing nature more than usual. So I think those like subtle lights definitely affected me more than usual. Well, you've definitely captured the subtlety of light and the variation of light in these paintings. They're really quite beautiful. Um, how did some of those questions about light and structure um, and the relationship between furniture, like you sent one of the images, your inspiration images you sent us at one point was a photograph of a chair by Donald, by the great sculptor Donald Judd. Um, but how do some of the, those inspirations inform your palette and materials? I think um, when I plan on all these series of the work, I was looking at like floor, wooden floor in the house. And I, I was looking at gallery like beam as well. Mm. I kind of wanted to see those like wooden color, the stained wooden color that is pretty heavy in my painting this time. Because that felt to me like a 
something that most people own in their house, like furniture, piece of furniture. So that was a big part of it. Well, I think they're also, in this case, the stretches are dark. And while there's very rich color in your paintings, they're also, because of the transparency, they're fairly light. And so it creates a nice contrast, I think. Um, I think it, it comes together really well. Um, Talk about the evolution of your work from the last show you had here at the gallery. Um, and um, how is the show kind of different? So the last show was a pair of two kind, or a pair, two of the same, excuse me. Um, and then this one, Windows, how are they similar? How are they different? Um, and maybe, you know, kind of just generally, but also in terms of the relationship of the surface to the structure. The former show, I was focusing on like, building fabric, woven fabric. I found the woven fabric very fascinating because I've been focusing on like architecture space a lot and the structure like horizontal vertical structure creates like space has been always something that I was into. And then as I building those woven fabric, I found that weft and warp creates that kind of space and even it creates like hollow space, like exposing the stretcher bars. So that be became like huge interest to me because it created really weird lightning in the, in the painting, create like illusionary space, but it's actually a real space because it created from the physical surface. So I wanted to make it a little bit obvious in this painting. I wanted to focus on like the raw material exposing through the painting. So I I made the hollow space even bigger in this. And I wanted to make the grid line more even visible. So they are all square in the show and the squares are all even size and they kind of stack up one another to create bigger or like narrow. I, I found it really interesting process to me personally. I found it very fun to work with. Well, it's interesting that you sent, I mean, I think uh, in the context of that, I, I, um, I understood when you first sent the Donald Judd chair image, I understood the idea of the relationship to furniture and the, the kind of like uh, rigorousness and reductive quality of his furniture. But now that you're, when you're, the way you're describing the paintings now as being almost modular in their construction, I'm suddenly understanding that relationship even more deeply. So I, I'm that that was just a moment of connection for me. Thank you. Um, in uh, also in your past show or your previous show, a, a pair two of the same. Um, I feel like some of the um, you mentioned the, that there was woven elements in them, um, and as well as the muslin and other things that you traditionally and linen and things that you traditionally use or or um, often use. But they also had um, elements that were almost clothing-like, like with the with the with the woven textiles, and so I think in that sense they kind of reference the body and garments. Um, whereas I feel like these the shows may be referencing more clearly architecture. And I'm just wondering if you can like is that um, were you trying to convey different things because with with those kind of two different approaches, or how are they similar? How are they different? What are the kind of connection points and dis the disparate points? I think they all came from the same thread because I still am interested in like intimate space, personal experience to the objects, people around me, something hidden or exposed at the same time. All those materials that I use, I they are Korean muslin and they often use for like body covering for the dead body. So they are like actually really warm color and really stiff at the same time. I found those materials are like working really well with my paint application. So I started using them a lot. And obviously sewing is really intimate experience too. And as I stretch, I kind of battle with the material a lot. So it's kind of all in there. I really enjoy the process of labor and <laughs> Having to battle with the material. Yeah, um, but anyway, I think they all come from the same place because 
all those like impressions that I get from those intimate experiences with the objects, people around me. I always try to capture them in a way. But I'm, I've noticed that I am starting focusing on more colors because I think color really is a big part of like refining those impressions on the surface. So that kind of wraps up the kind of prepared questions that we had, we, we talked about, but I, I'm going to ask two others if I may, which is um, uh, you just mentioned that you're using this particular kind of Korean muslin. That's a, that's a, I'm, it sounds like you said it's a warmer color. So I'm wondering if it's a natural fiber and non not bleached uh, fiber. Um, but also, um, um, I, uh, and you said something about how it takes the paint differently. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your choices around the mixing of materials and the fact that you use that muslin, which is for um, a particular um, funerary, uh, had, traditionally has a funerary application in relation to the body through that arena. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more just about like why that material in particular. One or, one of the thing I didn't mention is some of people who I know in Korea mentioned about those look like Korean traditional door or window, which make total sense to me because those fabric I use, I found it very close to like paper looking, very matte and absorb a lot. And it can actually hold a lot too, even though it's not as thick as canvas. It's like one grade right under canvas. So it's a little thinner, but it can hold a lot of paint. And it's just a really different experience compared to primed canvas. It almost, to me, using prime canvas always like push me when I apply paint. But this one always like absorb the paint really well and then creates like really weird color that I never expect. So I, I really enjoy going somewhere I never measure. I cannot measure. It's really mysterious. I love that. I love that you're by you're sort of letting us into part of the you know pleasure of your studio practice, which is to find something new that you know you're you're making a gesture based on something you want, but you also get something that you want, but something that surprises you. And that's kind of a one of the joys of a studio practice. And so it's wonderful that you, you know. Through that material, you could, you could tell us about that. My other question is about the stacking of the panels, and because you're working modularly, modularly, of course, you can, um, you know, more easily do that. But um, the two pieces we're looking at now, um, the that are 73 by 73 inches approximately, there's not only stacked, but they're actually uh, separated. So you see this wonderful like uh, relief between the top two panels and the lower panels, and you get this sense of uh, shadow and your relationship to color and light are connected um, by that. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit um, about that with these two pieces, but also the two opposite that are just the two pieces stacked that ha also have that relief between the two layers of panels or stretchers, not panels, excuse me. One thing when I started this series of the work, I wanted to make sure when I stand in front of the painting, everything looks within the rectangular or square shape. I didn't want them to have off square shape. So when you stand in front of the painting, even though it has a sculptural element, it's still square. That was one of my principle that I set before I start the work. And I, I, it was kind of just fun to play around like a little Lego piece going all together, create like fun shape that I, that I don't really expect. I was just playing around, and then I wanted to see more like shadow affects the painting and create like weird illusion in the painting. And I found that because it has the depths, different depths. The top one versus bottom one creates different amount of shadow, which creates very fun, to me, fun effect. And I really enjoy seeing those like 
unexpected outcome. I plan a lot for the structure, but I actually don't know what's going to actually happen with those structure. I cannot imagine, but I actually don't, cannot really measure all that details. So it's kind of fun to see how things go. It's a nice dance between the, the, the planned and the organized and the improvisational, it sounds like. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, which is actually from the comment thread. Uh, David Ellis um, is asking, he says, Jenny, these paintings are beautiful. What kind of paint do you use? So maybe you can answer that and then we'll uh, shift uh, into the next room for, for the next segment. I use liquid type of golden acrylic paint because <laughs> they should be a little diluted by water, but still I, I need certain amount of opacity from the paint. I found them, they work really well with my painting. Perfect. Well, you can tell that you're that there's a lot of liquidity. That there's that there you're working with liquid color. I mean, you know that that you're taking the paint and really working with it to get it the kind of both the opacity and transparency um, that you're wanting in your paintings. So, Jenny, thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has questions for Jenny Park, um, please go ahead and ask them in the comment thread. Um, if you have questions just about anything in general, please do that. Um, and Jenny, thank you so much. Um, and you. we're going to um, shift gears for a moment and talk with MK about MK Guth about her show. Um, and then we'll come back. And I think the two of you are going to ask each other a question towards the end. Um, so MK, uh, welcome. It's great to be here. This is MK Guth. Um, her exhibition is called Touching Matter, and it's on view, also on view uh, November 4th through December 31st of this year, 2021. Um, I was looking back at your CV um, to um, prepare for this and MK, and I was sort of um, impressed that you've uh, been showing with Elizabeth Leach Gallery for 22 years. And in that time, we've done 10 solo shows with you, which is very exciting. This is our 10th our solo show with you. And um, you have you have a really impressive CV, you know. Um, you Most recently, you had a show at the Sun Valley Museum of Art in Ketchum, Idaho, just last year. Um, in 2018, you had a show at the Witherspoon Art Museum in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, as well as a solo show at the Halle Ford um, I think the Witherspoon was a group show, but the Halle Ford show um, at Wyoming University in Salem in 2018 was a solo show, which I drove down for that opening, and it was such a fun, fun time. Um, and I know that a piece that was in that show was also featured at UCLA uh, recently. Um, of course, your seminal show, which kind of was the beginnings of this body of work, was at the Art Gym at Malehurst University in 2012. You've also shown at the Boise Art Museum, the Portland Art Museum, three times in 1999 in the Oregon Biennial, as well as your solo show at the Apex Space uh, in uh, 2008 um, in the lead up to the Whitney Biennial, as well as in 2016. You participated in the Melbourne International Arts Festival in Australia, and in 2008, which was a big year for you, um, you know, you had a big show at the Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, as well as your amazing installation uh, at the Whitney Biennial in New York City. Um, it's just it's impressive. I'm, we're excited to have your work in the gallery. Um, and um, just also mentioning that you've received some awards, um, the Bonnie Bronson Award, which is a really important award here in the Northwest, um, as well as um, the 2015, one of the 2015 Halle Ford Fellowships. So it is just a pleasure to work with you yet again. Thank you for being here tonight. Talk to us a little bit about your title, Touching Matter. So, um... Uh, touching matter is kind of just a play on words. The uh, work in this show is very kind of, it all references emotional states like love and humor and uh, the catharsis and release that comes from that or the emotional state of, of moving beyond something, getting over something. Um, so, so there's that, things that are touching and emotional and then and you know, then there's like the actual physical aspect that um, almost all of the work in the show, with the exception of the drawings, which come from the books, are interactive and are um, asked to be touched, to be picked up, and to look at the instructions for the in the various books, or to um, engage in the interactive piece, five thousand pages on love. So yeah, just play on words. 
Um, we were just looking at the book, uh, or sorry, the stack of books, 5,000 Pages on Love. Can you talk about how you arrived at the idea for this piece? Um, sure. In the So in my stacked um, book pieces, and there's been a few of them, they, I think they all, I mean, I mean, I think this is the case with everybody's work and listening to Jenny, I think she would relate to this, that, you know, they, these works in particular come out of very, connect to very particular conditions or events or situations at the moment of the time in which they're created. So for example, the first piece in this series um, was what needs to be said. And that was produced right after Donald Trump was elected president, and uh, I probably don't need to say more about that, but I felt like that was a time when um, people needed a space in which to get things off their chest, to speak to speak their mind. And since that moment in a series of these books have been produced, we've um, gone through a whole lot in this world. And we've been, um, folks have been uh, fighting for a lot of different causes from the environment to racial, social justice. We are living in a pandemic, which has become an endemic. It has just been a really tough time for folks. So I wanted to do something that I thought was more hopeful and would um, offer pause for us to, con for folks to consider the things that they value or care about or love. And perhaps if one writes about um, a place that they love, uh, a mountain, a lake, that will connect back to their care around um, climate justice and the environment. Or if we're writing about people in our community or folks that we care about, that these things are the ways that we keep our um, energy up for working towards all of the specific concerns that are in the world. And also just writing about the things that make it, uh, make being here all worthwhile, like a work of art or great music or uh, a favorite movie. So um, it kind of came out of my personal need to be looking at the world through more hopeful lens. Um, yeah. So um, I think you and I know about the interactive aspect of the piece, but for those joining us, um, online uh, uh, or who are going to visit the gallery later, hopefully, uh, and interact with it in person. Talk us through kind of the interaction of it. How is it intended to function? It's obviously a stack of five books, each a thousand pages um, devoted to a specific topic. And you're hoping that um, people will connect to it um, on those particular topics. But talk to us about how, how it functions. So the stacked works function in a couple different ways. They exist just simply as objects. They're graphic, and I hope that in in that way that you know when someone comes to them, they think about um, if you see five thousand pages of love, you think about um, the things that you care about or what other people might love, or just be um, confronted with the idea that there are five thousand things out there worth loving. And then there's the interactive aspect, and that aspect invites people to sit at the table and um, choose one of the books or write in all of them. Um, and you get a page. Each participant is offered a page to write um, and to reflect on something that they care deeply about. Maybe it, there's different subjects. So there's art and music and there's people and beings, there's place. So there's different prompts for folks to kind of get the juices going to think about what they might want to write about. And also it gives, I feel like in these interactive pieces when they're happening in an institutional space, it gives folks the opportunity to pause in the, um, in the exhibition and to reflect on the work and to um, reflect on, in this case, things that they care about. Um, so that, that's the way um, I encourage anybody who comes into the gallery to, to offer up or to spend time with the piece and to give some thought about the things that um, they value. I love that. I remember at, at your show at the Holly Ford Museum, uh, spending some time with the what needs to be said and you know picking my page and making entries in a few different of different of the books. It was it did feel really good to do it, and especially in a context 
like uh, a gallery or a museum where often we're not allowed to touch, um, you know, to be invited to sit down and interact, I thought was a special kind of a special gift. And it's interesting that, you, that you're taking that approach. Um, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that at all? I mean, I think it's when somebody's interacting in a gallery space or institutional space, that experience, your experience with the art becomes uh, visceral. It's inhabited in the body. And so it's a, it also marks a way of remembering. It's why all the pages in the books have numbers. So um, that you can remember, ah, I wrote on page five or I wrote on page uh, 105. Um, it's a way of denoting an experience and a way of remembering. And I think we not only remember with our, like our hearts and our minds, but we also physically remember. We remember through the gestures that we do. Um, so I know that the exhibition has several of the interactive pieces. The one we're inviting people to interact with in the gallery space, as well as three other interactive pieces, the dinner to tell a joke, um, the um, uh, dinner for a camas flower, I think if I'm, um, yeah, dinner for a camas flower, just sorry, checking the list, making sure I'm getting the names right, and uh, dinner for getting over it or at least through it. Um, those are pieces that are uh, interactive, but they're more interactive in a little bit more selective way. Could you wanna, I don't think I told you we were gonna ask you this question, but um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that, how these pieces function? Uh, sure, so I feel, so the shelf, I call them still lifes. So, um, and those pieces in my mind have kind of three different ways to engage. So there's contemplating viewing, just like you would any still life, just like you would come up to anything where a series of objects come together in the case of this piece, um, getting over it or at least getting through it. You have a bowl of matches, you have um, little books that invite you to write and tear off a page. And then you have a book with a hammer on it with a title all, and they all sit on a shelf together and those things come and create meaning. So there's this contemplative way of, of engaging the work. And then there is um, on the other spectrum, there's activating it, using the book, opening it up and engaging and activating one of the dinners with a group of people. So there's um, the objects are all meant to be used there's an archive at the back of each book so that you can chart, so that each time um, a dinner is activated, there's a history there. There's a way of um, holding that, who participated, when it happened. And then I say that there's a third aspect to these pieces and their interaction, which is, um, which is kind of imaginary. And what I mean by that is, is that Unlike a traditional still like, like a Giorgio uh, Morandi, you would never, you'd never uh, imagine like eating soup out of one of his bowls or drinking out of his vessels or putting flowers into, the, um, into a vase. But in the case of these works, um, I guess my hope is that people would come up to them and imagine using them, say, oh, dinner for a joke, who would I invite? Who needs that release? Who needs to laugh? Um, and they would imagine like who their guest list would be or using the cups, those red balls there actually flip over and they're the cups for the, um, they're the cups for the dinner. So there you go. But when everybody holds them up to drink, then it's like, it looks like a clown nose. So I feel kind of like a baseball term, which is, uh, you, which is, um, pure intangibles which when um, baseball or football, when scouts go out and look for um, professional athletes, they have all these stats on these individuals, but they don't really know how they're going to perform. And I think that's kind of how these operate. There's a lot of ingredients and that you can imagine how you might put them together and um, it changes every time. So, yeah. So can we, t I'd like to talk a little bit about the drawings on the wall and, um, you know, there, um, I understand that there's objects part of the part of the still lives and how they're activated, but what's the relationship of these works on paper and their relationship to the books and the, the still lives? Um, all of the works on paper, all the drawings are drawings from the book, um, Dinner for a Camas Flower. So, 
Uh, each of the books, they're filled with photographs, language, some have poems in them, they're, they have their instructions, and then they often are filled with um, drawings, uh, transparencies, there's all, all different types of things. And um, I have the books, I have the drawings and so forth scanned and then printed out. And I do this because I want the books to be sturdy enough for people to use. Um, Initially, I think my first couple of things that I tried were all handmade and it's when people are interacting with them, that fragility kind of makes the book kind of fall apart. And I wanted something that was a little sturdier. So these, all the drawings from this are the drawings, are a series of drawings that you would find in um, a, dinner, a dinner for a camas flower, which really has nothing to do with camas flowers, but yeah, uh, that's, I'm, more about that objects. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, uh, I, I that's it. I I think I, I'd love it if you just say a little bit about the premise of that piece because I know it was um, you, the, the you were invited by the Sun Valley Museum of the Arts to kind of create a piece um, and they do a I believe a Camus festival um, there and maybe you can just talk a little bit about the relation because I know that this particular um, one is a little bit different. It has fewer objects and the objects are, are malleable and changeable. And it's more about what people bring to it. Can you talk a little bit about that piece just briefly? And then um, I have one other question. Okay, sure. Um, so this piece, I was invited for the anniversary show at the Sun Valley Museum of Art um, last year. And um, it also corresponded to the Camus Festival. And so they did an exhibition called From the Color of Its Bloom, um, the Camus Prairie. And so as part of my research, I was invited out and I went with a group of women to, um, to the Camus fields, which I'd never been to before. And we um, used a stick and a shovel and dug um, Camus bulbs. And in this process, um, I was very aware that this was a very un unfamiliar um, physical set of gestures that I was doing. And I was also, I also understood that these gesture sequences that I was performing at that moment were performed for generations and generations, for thousands of years by um, the Nez Pierce and the um, Shoshone tribes. So in thinking about this amazing flower that holds all of this history, like one tiny little purple flower holds thousands of years of narratives, history, um, and stories. I decided that for the project, um, while the Camus flower story wasn't mine to tell, um, the idea that uh, an entity, an object, uh, a flower, a book, um, a perfume bottle, um, all these objects held narratives and histories, an ashtray. Um, and then I wanted to do a piece that was really about how these various different objects are, are imprinted or embedded with, with knowledge and history and um, stories. So the dinner actually invites people to, the host would choose a theme, so maybe objects smaller than a bread box or objects that are from winter. And a dinner would get together, everyone brings the object that they want to discuss and um, people tell the stories of the objects that they hold. So, because I think objects really do anchor people. It's why we keep letters and we why we keep certain books or t-shirts or um, ornaments. They're, they're tethered to kind of our, we, we're tethered to them and they're tethered to our histories. So um, if you're uh, in the audience, um, please, and you have questions, please go ahead and ask. I think if you're watching through our website, there's not necessarily a question, um, a question option there, but if you are on YouTube or on our Facebook Live, I believe you can ask a question there and it will show up here on my computer and I will, um, I will, um, Ask it. This is a comment here from David Ellis, who asked Jenny a question earlier. But um, I know there's someone else who's been trying, who's is texting me to ask a question. I said you could you could text or 
um, or do it in the chat if you're on one of the platforms with that chat option. But I have another question and then I'm gonna turn it over to the artists to ask questions of each other. Um, MK, you have um, you talk you have specific ideas about the residue of the performances or what post activation looks like um, for your practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure. I think so. I think one of the things that um, is important to me is that um, the work is anchored to something other than documentation. So the performative aspect has something that anchors it, and what I mean by that is I tend to work in one of two ways. Either there's a performative element where people are engaging in something that creates an object, or there are a set of objects, or in this case, the still lives, that initiate a performative aspect or a form of interaction. And for me, um, I feel like these objects or the archives in the books, or for example, the braid projects or the stacks, they, they're containers for the experience, but they don't illustrate the performative element. And one of the things for me, while I totally recognize the importance of documentation, especially within performative works and how important that is to many artists, for me, I'm not really interested in traditionally showing um, videos of the performances that I do, but rather because I think in some ways what happens in that case is um, you're showing, I don't wanna show those in galleries because often you're showing folks what they missed. And what I'd rather do is give people a new experience. So maybe you're not um, activating um, a dinner for a joke, but there's an object there that you can experience, a set of objects or a still life that you can experience and have your own relationship with, rather than watching other people um, engage in an activity. So for me, these objects are the containers for these experiences, but not something that illustrates them, so that they're always offering up something fresh and new to um, a new audience member. That's great. Now, I, I can ask one other question, um, um, and then I have a question from an audience member, but um, the flags, the love flags, um, talk a little bit about, about the flags and the activation of the space with, with those, your basically drawings on textile. Um, yeah, that's exactly what they are. I wanted, I um, had finished the um, 5,000 pages on love, and I wanted to activate the space in such a way that it, it had a kind of warm and um, hopeful tone to it. Something that, I mean, I've always kind of liked how flags are used for all these different sets of, in all these different conditions. Um, and I wanted something that in this space, first of all, created something that was warm for the people who interacted with the, um, with 5,000 pages in love, create kind of a space that was a little more welcoming and warm rather than just kind of white walls. And um, something that kind of connected to the tone of the book itself. There, it's fun to have them. I love the way they activate the space, not only in terms of the flags themselves, but the way they activate and create shadow uh, and light. And that's a beautiful play. Um, uh, and then the question from the audience member is from Stephanie Snyder, and she's asking, emotional life is messy and confusing, and yet the activated works are first presented as beautiful artisanal crafted tableau. Uh, why is this? Why such pristinely beautiful objects in the face, face of the emotional body? Um, thanks, Stephanie. That's a great question. And um, I think for me, the way the objects operate, I would hope, would entice the viewer into that. You know, it's um, our emotional states are super messy. Even things that are like hopeful and positive are are complicated and messy. But when I'm, what I want to do is invite people in to engage, and I feel like creating something that is um, a little more simple and ordered allows people to contribute their emotional aspects rather than compete with something that's more chaotic in the work. This is just for me. Like when we bring our emotions to 5,000 pages of love, 
I want people to have their opportunity for it to be messy and chaotic in the book rather than them having to kind of peel through that in the work itself to get to it, if that makes sense. Um, and a follow-up question was, do you feel the beauty creates a safe space? Yes. And I think it creates a, a simple space that allows um, people to be comfortable with interacting with them. And that's why in some ways, why the books are hard bound and because they're, you're not worried about like damaging them, you know, they're like sturdy. So both kind of, um, Stephanie uses the word beauty, but I would say ordered and simple for me. Um, hopefully will drive people to the work. I also, you know, I also appreciate that too. Like there are aspects of kind of formal considerations that I find satisfying. And I think often those formal considerations and those simplicities um, give room to the viewer. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking with you about your work. Um, there's always so much more than initially meets the eye, which is always a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to see if either of you had questions for each other. I, uh, we, we sometimes have this happen and um, I think we, we let you know. Um, Jenny, do you have a question for MK or MK, do you have a question for Jenny? I, I really enjoy seeing like food components in artwork in general. But I see a lot in your work, which I really appreciate because I'm a big food lover and I love like recipe book, cooking experience itself or just food itself. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with food in your work or in general, any kind of food relationship? <laughs> sure. Um, I feel for me, food, um, A, I'm, you know, I love to eat. So there's that. And I like to cook. But more importantly, I like the conveniality of the table where people come together and the ritual of eating. Like I, I find the diversity of cultural ritual around food um, kind of, I, I'm gonna say exciting because it doesn't matter kind of where, everybody can connect to food because everybody eats. And traditionally when people come to the table, there's, there's always forms of convenience conviviality and ritual. And I feel in making works that are interactive or asking people to be physically interactive, finding a place, uh, creating a place that has recognizable rituals like food does is something that is comfortable and joyful maybe. And, and I think when things are familiar in that respect, then you can talk about um, you can kind of dig in with more complicated subject matter. And this is how I imagine it to be. Um, MK, thank you for the question. MK, can, do you have a question uh, for Jenny about her work? Yeah, actually, gosh, I have so many. And um, I really enjoyed listening to you talk about your work and it opened up so many. It's actually pivoted the questions that I wanted to talk about. So. I'm going to go to one in particular that also kind of became amplified in the way you talk about your work, because you talk about your work as a painter, as a sculptor, and as a craftsperson. Like there's these different gestures that you bring to your work, the fluidity of the painterly gesture, the, um, the kind of the labor of the sculptor and the woodworker, and this intimacy of sewing. And when I was reading about your work over the last week or so, I also realized that people describe, you described your work as paintings, but then in the visual art source, they described them as mixed media wall sculpture sculptures. And then even in the, um, in the gallery, they're, uh, they're described as visual works. Can you talk about how this kind of fluidity of language and forms of making inform inform the work for you or how however you want to address that question or those <laughs> sets of thoughts you know i 
I saw Sean Scully, like really sculpture or painting one time at Philadelphia Art Museum. And I was like, that is amazing. And I got influenced by his work, like really sculpture work. And I think he view himself as painter, I think, I think. And I saw his recent painting, it wasn't abstract, it was like representation of painting. I I loved it. I love that like he can go from wherever, but he's still a painter. And I I think I always view myself as a painter. I always see things as like painterly way. Yeah. Even like building and making things I really enjoy. I I just think the experience of building like sewing all that experience is so intimate and it it brings up to the painting. So I think it become all together, but I see everything as a painting. That's why I wanted to make them not actually like, when you see it from the front view, you don't see the dimension. You see the like shadow, but it's still in, within the square shape. That's what I wanted to really show. Doesn't Thank have like funky shape out of ordinary kind of shape. Just, I'm curious, I'm just gonna follow up on my own question. In, in this process of sewing or this process of building, how, how do you gain something in, that, in those gestures that affect the way you um, apply, apply the paint or think about the paint, like just in the physical gesture of it? Because I find like sewing, like there's something meditative about it. Definitely, definitely. When I, whenever I get like really exhausted by painting, I just go yeah. and sew and then come back to paint. I go back and forth. Also like whenever I make mistake, it affects my paint application. So they're all connected. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I, I Sometimes I make mistake with the sewing and I just go with it to see how it becomes part of the painting. And I always didn't want to make just the illusion, illusionistic space. I wanted to present like actual physical space. And I thought about like when you open the window, you can almost feel the outside and window frame, you can actually touch it. Yeah. But if you close the window, you only see the like view of outside through the glass but I wanted to show a little bit like opening when you open the window can I see both view yeah it's I mean they're beautiful thank you <laughs> they are both shows um, I want to thank you both so much for being here and um, answering my questions and questions from the audience. Um, if you're in the audience and you have a question, this is your last moment to ask it. I'm going to um, just say a little bit more about the shows. And then um, if, I if another question pops up, I'll ask it. But otherwise, um, I just want to invite you all. Um, well, first of all, thank both you artists. Uh, Jenny Park and MK Guth for joining me tonight, but also thank everyone in the audience um, for joining us. And um, our, the exhibitions are Jenny Park Windows and MK Guth Touching Matter, and both of them will be on view November 4th uh, today through December 31st uh, of this year. So it'll wrap up the end of the show. Um, you can visit uh, the gallery 24 seven online. We have online viewing rooms for both of these shows, uh, or you can stop by in person, um, no appointment needed. We are open Tuesday through Saturday, 1030 to 530. Um, and we invite you to stop by. Um, we would love to see you and have you come in and uh, experience both these shows in person. Um, and it looks like we, uh, then we had more of a comment pop up, but I did. I was just sort of like, oh, something did pop up there in the in the chat. And uh, Kate Baker just said, excited to come in and see the show and experience the shows. So I want to thank you both so much for being here. I want to thank the audience for joining us uh, on behalf of myself um, and Elizabeth Leach um, and the whole team. Thank you for the beautiful shows, and um, we're really enjoying. Uh, just living with them this few first few days of the show and we look forward to two months of getting to uh enjoy them 
thank you both so much for being here and um good night i guess thanks for thanks daniel thanks jen thank you mk thanks thank you all out there <laughs>